Good evening, everybody. We are just going to wait for everyone to join us and then we'll get going. Just let everyone come in. Evening, everyone. We're just waiting for everyone to join us. We'll just give it a minute or less and then we will get started. Good evening. Okay, I think we've got a few more people coming in and then we're going to get going. Righto folks, thank you very much for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Kerry Porteous, I'm one of the operations managers at Nature Trek. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you this evening to talk to us about, or listen to us talk about Southern Africa. I'm going to be joined by two of my colleagues from the Nature Trek office, uh, Paul Stanbury and Georgie Head. Um, we've also got tour leader Ben Chappell, who's joining us from up the road in London. And not with us just yet, um, we're hoping you'll get him along in the next few minutes, is Neil McLeod, who is coming along from all the way over from Namibia. So he's a little bit delayed, but we'll have him before too long. Um, we've certainly been feeling a boost this um, week from the government changing legislation about return COVID testing. That's been really good news for us that you don't need to do it anymore. Um, and we seem to have, we seem to have Paul on the screen. Not Georgie. <laughs> What's going on? Right. I should be back now. Am I back now? Yeah. Excellent. Yeah, no, sorry right. about that. <laughs> Right, let's, let's carry on. I was just saying, um, let's go around here. Um, sorry about that. Right, so we have had a good boost from this change in legislation. Um, it's moved a big headache for us, so that's really good news. Um, and also we moved the worry for you um, about testing positive and being stranded abroad, so that's good news. Um, I've actually just returned from maternity leave over the last year. So the last time I was here hosting, um, we were in deep dark lockdown three. Um, no one was operating tours anywhere, not even day trips. So it's been really positive to be back. Um, I've been organising tours to Sweden, to Mexico, to the Gambia, to the Maldives, all going in the next week or so. That's really good news too. Um, as always, if you've got any questions, pop them into our Q&A box. We'll um, find some answers during the evenings for you, or we will um, answer them at the end. We'll have a, a session from 9, 9.05 onwards to answer any questions then. Um, but without further ado, I will hand you over to Georgie and she will kick off the evening talking about Zambia. So over to you, Georgie. Thank you very much, Kerry. And sorry, everyone, again, for my technical issues there earlier. Um, <laughs> hopefully this should all work now. So let's give it a go. So there we go. Excellent. Um, so this evening I will be speaking to you about Zambia, um, which is one of my very favourite countries in Central Southern Africa. Um, I am actually NatureTrek's tailor-made manager, but we do offer holidays to Zambia as well as all over the world. Um, and this evening I will be predominantly talking to you about the South Luangwa National Park, which is the main one that we feature on our group holidays. Um, but we do, we can do extensions to any of the other national parks or we could organise tailor-made holidays if you prefer. So Zambia is actually covered in 20 national parks. It covers a third of the area, so it's very, very well protected. And, um, oh, sorry, this has not gone well. Um, there you go, hopefully you can see that again there. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and, oh, wrong way, going well. So sorry. Right, there we go. So as you can see, it's positioned here in central southern Africa. Um, we've got borders to Botswana, Zimbabwe, Malawi, Tanzania. Um, so it's really in the heart of that safari district. Um, and we can organise extensions to any of those areas as well. So this is South Luangwa. Um, it's uh, named for the Luangwa River that flows all the way through it. Uh, as you can see here, this is the, the dry season when the river is completely dried um, but it is um, on a, a, a floodplain which is completely flat so during the green season the, um, the it, it completely floods the area bringing lots of sort of fertile silt and soil um, and then that um, pr provides the opportunity for plenty of plants and um, just a, a huge biodiversity huge abundance of wildlife and it really is a premier game reserve in in Zambia. 
So elephants are widely abundant throughout South Luangra. Um, they're slightly smaller than the elephants that we might find in Botswana or um, elsewhere in, in Southern Africa. Um, but they're sort of naturally migratory. So towards the dry season, they do tend to come down to the rivers um, and we'll see them very regularly. Hippos are also hugely abundant in South Luangra. Um, probably more here than almost any other park in southern Africa um, and particularly during the dry season um, when the water sources um, become smaller and smaller they get concentrated into these very small areas and you get literally hundreds um, and they're bellowing and fighting um, and it really is very dramatic indeed. But one of my very favourite reasons of visiting South Luangra is for the southern carmine bee eaters. Now these come every year between around August and November. Um, they nest in the banks of the dry river banks of the Luangwa River and their nest holes can uh, be about two meters deep. So they very, are very complex systems. But why they're so spectacular is the sheer abundance that they come in um, during this season. And the, the colors that we get, the, the crimsons, the blues, um, it, it really is a spectacular sight. So again, with, um, with the river, most of the lodges that we find in South Luangra are located on the riverbanks. This is uh, Kafunta River Lodge, which we've used for over 20 years now. Um, very comfortable, very well decorated. Um, but most importantly, you can see here that it's got these wonderful verandas that are right on the, um, the river. So when we're here during the heat of the day, during our downtime, we can still enjoy lots of wonderful wildlife spectacles right from our own doorstep. I've included this slide because this is something that you won't see in South Luangwa. Um, so it, there won't be any of these sort of crowded jeeps, which can be um, yeah, sort of quite upsetting to see for both the wildlife and environmentally. Um, this is more the, the kind of uh, scene that we're likely to see here. So there are open sided safari vehicles from um, all of the lodges in South Luangwa. So fantastic for photography. Um, they, there are also no tarmac roads in South Luangwa, which again is, is lovely for photography and really gives it a really wild feel. So generally in a day, uh, we will go out first thing in the morning. We'll spend about three hours out on safari just after first light. And then we'll come back for this lovely uh, brunch. They, they tend to be very substantial brunches. Um, and yeah, one of the things that I absolutely love about Luangra is how incredible the food is. Considering that we're in such a remote environment, uh, the food really is unlike anywhere else I've stayed really. Then during the heat of the day, you can experience some downtime, um, say relaxing from your, from your chalet or tent, um, or a lot of the lodges actually have these, uh, these hides where, where you can spend a few hours. So you can literally be out looking for wildlife all day if you like to. Then at around four o'clock, we will head out on an afternoon game drive. Um, so we'll go out for about two hours and then around six o'clock, we'll get to experience one of these really wonderful African sunsets like nowhere else in the world. It's all very civilized. We'll have a gin and tonic or a glass of wine uh, and just relax for a few minutes and just enjoy the, the sounds of the bush as we watch the sun go down. But then again, one of the best things about South Luangra is that we can continue our game drives right into the evening. And so we can do some nighttime spotlighting for nocturnal mammals, such as this Cape porcupine. Um, we could see honey badger. Uh, we might see spotted genets or civets or plenty of mongooses um, or even perhaps this lesser galago. We'll also see species that we might see during the daytime, but a lot of these are actually much more active at nighttime. So we might be lucky enough to witness a fresh kill like we've seen here from this leopard. Leopards are also very um, easy to see during the day. Uh, it's probably easier to see a leopard in South Luangra than it is anywhere else in the world. Um, they are hugely abundant in the reserve. And um, we, you, you'd probably be pretty lucky pretty unlucky not to see one. Um, they, they really are that common, but obviously nothing can be guaranteed. Other predators we might hope to see, um, lions are there in great abundance. Uh, we've got spotted hyenas, wild dogs. 
And then of course, because there are so many predators, they, they need something to feed on. Um, so there are lots and lots of different antelopes. There's actually 14 different species of antelopes to be found in South Luangwa. Um, we've got the, the greater kudu that you can see here with those magnificent horns. We've got impala, um, puku are also very prevalent in the park. Um, and yeah, so the puku are, are particularly good because often um, that's how we're able to locate some of the leopards and, and other predators through the, the barking alarm call of the puku. And our guides are very well adept in, um, in picking out those alarm calls from the, the antelopes and the birds as well. Some unique species or subspecies that we hope to find here um, are the Thornycroft's giraffe. Um, this subspecies is completely endemic to the Luangwa Valley. There are no captive populations anywhere in the world. Um, there's about 550 remaining in Luangwa, so we, you'll be certainly very uh, likely to see one during your holiday. Um, but if you want to go and see a Thornycroft's giraffe, you're going to have to head to Zambia. Another endemic subspecies is the Cookson's wildebeest, uh, which is an endemic subspecies of blue wildebeest, and we've got very good chances for these. And the Crayshaw zebra, uh, which is a near endemic subspecies of the plains zebra. Um, as you can see here, they've got much thinner stripes than you might find elsewhere in, in other plains zebra. Now it's impossible to talk about South Luangwa without discussing walking safaris, as South Luangwa really is the home of the walking safari. And these were started by pioneering conservationist Norman Carr in the 1950s. Um, it was a time when sort of hunting was much more common um, and he sort of uh, changed that for, for everyone and um, did some amazing work, which, which still goes on today. As you can see here, walking safaris nowadays are not that different. Um, you will head out with your guide in the morning along with an armed scout and um, on the walking safaris you, you're not really looking for sort of the, the big predators and other big ticket items that you might be on the, um, the, the game drives. Instead here you'll be focusing on learning more about the ecosystem, you'll learn about the plants and the insects and how all the wildlife interacts together and it really does give you a much greater appreciation about this incredible ecosystem um, and the other wildlife that, that we'll be focusing on throughout the holiday. It's possible to do walking safaris between a few of the different camps um, if you're particularly interested in walking safaris um, or alternatively you can mix and match with some walking and some game drives. The walking's very easy indeed as, as I said earlier it's a very flat landscape across Luangwa um, so it's certainly not arduous trekking by any means. So I've talked recently a lot about the dry season in South Luangwa, which is when most people will choose to visit. Uh, but for birders, it's certainly worth considering visiting during the, the green or emerald season, as it's known in South Luangwa. Um, and this is when we will find some of the best bird life. Um, obviously, at this time, the sort of um, populations are bolstered by the, the northern migrants but also um, the impressive bleak breeding plumage of the, the existing birds is, is truly incredible. This paradise wider, um, if you'd seen it a couple of months earlier, it would look like a very sort of brown, innocuous looking bird. Um, but here it's got those fantastic tail feathers. Um, and I think you'll agree it really is spectacular. Other birds that we might hope to see here are the African pitta. Um, there are some camps around South Luangwa where they are seen quite regularly. Um, so for birders, that's, that's normally a real target. Uh, also some great owling. This is the Vero's eagle owl with the fantastic pink eyelids. Uh, we've got the Pell's fishing owl, which can be seen regularly around a few of the camps. And also in the green season, um, it's one of the very best times to see wild dogs in South Luangra. So a lot of the wild dogs in the park are actually uh, collared um, for, for sort of monitoring purposes, but this means that we know where their dens are. Um, so it can be much easier to see them during the green season than any time other time of year. You'll also see um, well from this photo that the photographic opportunities are amazing. The, uh, the, it's much less hazy than it is during the sort of dustier um, time around the dry season. And it's also very nice to visit um, because you've got sort of the, the carving uh, mammals as well. So it's, it's a lovely time for new life. And um, yeah, it, it, it's a very um, different but, but equally spectacular time of year to visit. 
So next I will talk about the North Luangwa National Park, which as its name suggests is, is north of the river. Um, this park is much, much more inaccessible than South Luangwa. It sees far fewer visitors and during much of the year it's only accessible by, um, by aircraft, by charter flight. A lot of the um, camps can only be accessed by aircraft and so with that it's only possible to do walking safaris in many of the areas. But with that, you do get this real, real sense of exclusivity uh, and a real feeling that you are completely out in the wilds. This is Muwaleshi Camp, um, which is comprised of only three chalets, so just six people. Um, so it's perfect for sort of an intrepid family who, who might like to go and visit. Um, and wildlife wise, uh, it's quite similar in a lot of ways to South Luangwa. Um, there are good numbers of buffalo and some different antelope species. Again, uh, this fantastic eland that you can see with the, the lovely carmine in the background. Um, and also bird life. There's some great birds uh, here as well. We'll see some grey crown cranes, the broadbill rollers, uh, and a huge diversity of, of those that can be found in South Wangra, as well as in the northern part of the park. So next we will head over to the Lower Zambezi National Park, which as its name suggests, is um, in the lower part of the Zambezi River. So as you can see here, it's um, mainly water-based activities that we'll enjoy here. Um, and actually on the other side of the river, you'll find the Mana Pools National Park in Zimbabwe. So you'll find a very similar habitat, very similar wildlife, and the wildlife is free to sort of roam between the two national parks. So predominantly we'll take out these silent electric motorboats during holidays to the Lower Zambezi. Um, we'll also see lots of elephants and hippos and similar wildlife here. We could also take out some bokoros uh, as a, a different way of, of enjoying the wildlife. So um, wildlife wise, there are um, lots of lots of leopards in this part, uh, this park. Uh, there's also lots of lions um, and many predators. I would say the diversity in the Lower Zambezi is lower um, than in South Luangwa, but what there is, it does have in, in great abundance. So next I will move on to the Kasanka National Park. Um, so this is the location for the world's largest mammal migration. So most people will assume that that would be the Great Migration in Kenya or Tanzania. But actually, it's this fantastic um, migration of uh, the world's entire population of straw coloured fruit bats who literally come in their hundreds of thousands and completely blanket the sky um, with, with black, basically. Um, they will come to an area no more than two kilometres squared um, and, and congregate there. Nobody knows why they do it. Um, but yeah, each November for a period of two weeks, it is this truly incredible wildlife spectacle. And with it, they do attract um, raptors and, and predators as well. So we'll see martial eagles, we'll see crowned eagles, and other raptor species that could be quite difficult to see elsewhere, who are just attracted by this huge concentration of, um, of, of prey. Also in Kasanka, we will look for the Sitatunga antelope. Uh, now this antelope is notoriously shy, and although it can be seen in a few different national parks in Africa, it's by far easier to see in Kasanka than anywhere else. So they are completely uh, swamp dwelling species, completely amphibious. Uh, they've got these splayed hooves to allow them to walk along the water. Um, and that does mean that they're quite clumsy indeed when they are um, on, the, on the land. So they will spend pretty much all of their time in water. In other places, you might hope to see them very occasionally, just one at a time. But in Kasanka, you can see up to sort of 10 or 15 even if you're lucky. Um, so it really is a great place to visit. So we'll then head up to the Bangrulu floodplains, um, which again is a site where we can hope to see this other magnificent antelope, which is the uh, Black Lechwe. Um, so this is one of the last remaining strongholds of the Black Lechwe, who can be seen in their thousands, um, although their numbers are sadly declining. They are another swamp dwelling species. But the main reason that most people will visit the Bangrulu floodplains is to see the shoebill. Now these 
prehistoric, fantastic looking birds are some of my absolute favourites. And Bangrulu is one of the very best place to see them. So between sort of May and September, we'll head out um, on some dugout canoes and hope to see one of these magnificent birds or perhaps even a pair of them if we're very lucky. We'll then move on to the Kafui National Park. Now this is the largest national park in Zambia um, and it uh, was previously the largest national park in, in Africa. Um, it has now been taken over by the Kruger, but it is absolutely massive. Um, so most people will start on the outskirts of the park, um, at one of these lodges such as Mukambi Safari Lodge, where we'll take a lot of um, water-based safaris again on the river, the Kafui River that runs all the way through it. But primarily, most people who head here will be looking to go to the Busanga Plains, which are really the jewel in the crown of Kafui. So unlike much of Kafui, which is covered in this Miombo woodland, uh, the, the plains of Busanga are these flat, open grasslands. And although the wildlife can be more difficult, certainly to see, than uh, in places like South Luangra, there are very, very few um, very few camps indeed so you will find pretty much no other tourists whilst you're there so it really is this exclusive fantastic wilderness um, that you'll be experiencing during your time there. It's also one of only two parks in Zambia where you can see cheetah um, and other um, sort of less common antelopes such as sable and rowan antelopes. So next we'll head on to the Liua Plains National Park now, if I said that Kafui is um, quite remote and uh, difficult to access and there aren't many lodges, then Liu Plains is even more extreme than that. Again, there's only one permanent lodge actually in the park itself, and most people choose to access that via um, helicopter. So that, that shows you how just how remote it is. But when you get there, it is absolutely worth it for these truly remote wilderness areas that we'll enjoy during our time there. So Liua is the um, site of the second largest uh, wildebeest migration in the world. Uh, they'll come over from Angola sort of every November time at the start of the rains. And Liua is also really well known for uh, its lions. So in the 1990s, lions were poached pretty much to extinction uh, in the park with just one lone lion remaining, who is called Lady Liua. And she survived for many, many years um, pretty completely on her own. But since then, um, other lions have been reintroduced to join Lady Liwa, and she actually established a new pride in the park. Um, and there are a couple of prides there now who are, who are very well established and are doing well. Um, so it really is a conservation success story. There's also some lovely birds um, to be enjoyed there, such as this hot and tot teal. Um, and again, in some of the Miombo woodlands, we've got woodland kingfisher and other woodland specialities. Now, any holiday to Zambia, most people will choose to end at the Victoria Falls and, and certainly for good reason. So you might choose to stay at one of these um, sort of uh, quite swanky colonial style hotels such as the Victoria Falls Hotel right in the middle of the Victoria Falls town itself. But most of our guests will prefer to stay somewhere like this. This is Waterbury Lodge on the banks of the Zambezi. It's about half an hour drive from the town um, and it's just so much more remote, so much more tranquil. Uh, guests can enjoy bird, walks, bird watching excursions. We can enjoy sunset boat cruises on the Zambezi. Um, and it really is a much more relaxing way to enjoy the Victoria Falls, uh, much more in keeping with uh, what most of our guests will be looking for. So the Victoria Falls themselves, this is a photo from the Zimbabwean side of the falls, um, which pretty much I think everyone would agree is the more um, spectacular side. It's very easy to get a visa to go across to the Zimbabwean side for just a few hours. Um, so, so you can do both sides of the falls in a day. So this is also another photo from the Zimbabwean side, uh, which is taken during the dry season. If this was a wet season, um, it would be almost impossible to see. There would be such a spray, such a cloud of water um, that it, it really is a spectacular place and time of year. It really is a spectacular place, whatever time of year you would like to visit. So that is where my presentation will end. Thank you very much for, for bearing with me through that very whistle stop tour of uh, Zambia. I'll end with a nice Zambian sunset there um, before I pass over to Paul, who will be speaking to you about Botswana. Thanks very much for listening.
Thank you very much, Georgie. Right, let me just share my screen. Bear with you one second. Yeah. Right, okay, I seem to have just hopped forward a couple of slides. Okay, right, well, I'll say good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for tuning in. Um, my name is Paul Stanbury. Um, I'm now going to take you down to uh, Botswana and show you some of the wildlife and scenic highlights of, uh, of this uh, fabulous um, African safari destination. So Botswana, so where is it? It's right down in, in Southern Africa. Um, it's to the southwest of, of, uh, of sorry, to the south of, uh, of, of Zambia, where Georgie's just been taking you around, straddles the Tropic of Cap Capricorn um, and offers one of the last truly unspoiled wilderness is um, left, in, left in the whole of Africa. So we fly from, um, from London down to Johannesburg in South Africa initially, and then from Joburg, um, we fly up into Botswana itself. Um, and depending on which tour you opt to, um, to choose, then you either fly into Morn to, to explore the Okavango Delta. We can fly up to Livingston, and Victoria Falls to start there and go down into Chobe uh, National Park. So most of so the two, so the two popular trips that we that we offer to northern Botswana, um, we have our Botswana's Desert and Delta Safari, um, which includes seven nights of fully serviced mobile camping on the edge of the Okavango Delta, um, split between the Kwai Concession and uh, Maremi Game Reserve. We do two forms of this trip. We do a mammal focused tour. So if you're particularly keen on your mammals then that's the one to go for. And um, we also do a couple of birding departures as well. So if you're very keen on um, seeing some of the more um, unobtrusive and uh, less showy birds, um, then pick your birding trip, pick the birding trip. Of course, on both tours, you're gonna to see plenty plenty of uh, mammals too. So we run most of our Botswana tours um, in the dry season, which stretches from August through to um, November. But we've also got some um, at the, um, the greener, wetter time of the year in April and May. And that's an, it is a nice time to go, particularly if you're interested in birds, as Georgie mentioned in Zambia, um, when Africa greens up all of the widows and the wythers and the weavers molt into their wonderful, spectacular breeding plumage. And you've also got birds moving down from further north um, to, uh, to, to winter there as well. Um, so say so this trip is split between Kwai and Maremi. Kwai boasts one of the, some of the best game viewing anywhere in the Okavango. And since the private concession, um, you can do um, walks and night drives in Kwai, which you can't do in Maremi. So Maremi is a game reserve and that, Maremi is one of the finest um, game reserves really anywhere in Africa. Uh, covers over 5,000 square kilometers of the eastern side of the Okavango Delta. So as well as this seven night trip, we also do um, a longer two week safari called Botswana's Highlights. And that starts up in Livingston at Waterbury Lodge, a place that George showed you, and then moves through Chobe National Park, um, through to Chobe, down to Savuti, and then in, into the Maremi area um, to, to end before flying out of Moor. So one of the great things about Botswana and the vehicles that, that we use, um, we use fully open-sided vehicles, um, great visibility, you've got sunshade um, over the top but, and step rows of seats in the back, so great, great visibility, uh, really good if you're keen on photography as well. And um, we tend to um, mostly focus on mobile um, camping safaris in, in Botswana. And that really does get you out into the wilds. Um, and we use private private campsites. So these are not public campsites. 
Um, our groups have exclusive use of the of the sites, um, and the the tents are comfortable. They're set up by the camp staff. You don't need to worry about doing any of the camp chores, of course, all the cooking and the cleaning and the setting up and taking down of the campsite is all dealt with by the by the camp staff. This isn't sort of camping in the UK where you're laying on the floor with a root in your back in the pouring rain. It's, it's, it's comfortable camping. There are proper camp beds, proper bedding, pillows. Um, each camp, each tent has its own bush loo um, out the back, its own private bush, bush loo um, with a bucket shower, which the guys will fill up with warm water for you um, when, when needed. Um, now, I first started, did these Botswana safaris over, over 20 years ago. You never had the luxury of having your own bush glue. You had to sneak out in the night with a torch, shine it around to make sure that there's no eye shine, nip to the toilet tent, and then back into the, to the tent to uh, go back to sleep. Um, and in the morning, you're woken up by the beautiful song of the uh, white-browed robin chat. Um, the uh, of the Hugo's robin which has a very it's a beautiful fluty sound and is one characteristic. Um, songs of the of the Okavango region. Um, so say we time our Okavango tours mostly for the end of the dry season or during the dry season when the water has receded um, and the game is that much that bit more concentrated. So we explore a mix of um, of wetlands um, and Mpani woodland. Um, the the Okavango is the world's largest in the delta and is fed by the by the water um water that rainwater that falls in gap and golden hide highlands um a thousand miles to the um and to the northwest but it's a mix of these open um wet areas and mapani uh woodland um and the different habitats also have a different range of birds and and wildlife to to look for um, as with most African safaris, you're up and out at dawn, you're woken up before sunrise, given a cup of coffee, some water to have a quick, quick wash, and then you head out to enjoy the coolest um, part of the day when the wildlife is at its most active. And you're out on your safari until half 10, 11 o'clock, then you're back to camp for a, a brunch and a siesta before heading out again uh, later on in the, in the afternoon. Plenty of elephants in, in Botswana. In fact, Botswana has the world's largest population of, of elephants. So you'll see these wonderful animals commonly throughout the trip. There are over 130,000 elephants in, in, in Botswana at the moment. Large numbers of buffalo as well, um, herds numbering in the hundreds, sometimes in thousands during the, um, especially during the dry season when they, when they congregate together in, in massive herds. There are plenty of zebra. Um, these are the virtuals type with the shadow striping um, on the flanks um, and other antelopes and ungulates to, um, to look for and enjoy um, as well. There are a greater kudu. Um, this is a, 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 a male a greater kudu. Plenty of impala. And if you're lucky, maybe some of, the, some of the rarer species such as rowan and, and sable um, antelopes. And the giraffes here are southern giraffes, um, and they again are common and, uh, and, and frequently frequently seen, sometimes in some sizable herds. And where you've got such an abundance of, pre of prey, of course, you, you've got the predators, um, and uh, lion are, are commonly seen throughout the Moremi and Kwai and the Okavango area uh, in, in general. And you might be lucky enough to see a leopard lounging, lounging up in a tree. Uh, during the during the heat of the day, um, and one of the main animals that anybody um, travelling to Botswana on safari would really like to see is the the African wild dog. Um, Botswana is one of the best places from anywhere in, in Africa to see this uh, amazing animal. It has one of the highest densities of wild dogs. I'll, I'll let Ben tell you about their ecology and a bit more about them when he does his talk um, after the break. And where you've got the predators with the prey, of course, you've got plenty of scavengers as well. So spotted hyenas um, are, are commonly seen um, and around the around the, the, the lion and leopard kills, you'll get jackals and 
a variety of vultures, marabou storks, and other and other birds and, and animals that come down and scavenge the, the leftovers. So, of course, as well as the mammals, the bird life is, is absolutely abundant and, and colourful and diverse. Over 600 species of birds have been recorded in Botswana, um, which is a pretty high number for a landlocked country without any coast, um, and with um, which is you know, most of Botswana is, is desert, it's only really the Okavango and a couple of other areas which are greened up due to the, the, the permanent water. Um, the carmine bee eaters, so which Georgie showed you spectacular colonies of carmines along the Luangra River. You should see southern carmine as well in, um, in Botswana. Beautiful, other beautiful birds, such as the southern red bishop. Um, so if you particularly want to see the birds in their breeding finding, as I say, go earlier on in the year um, after the rains when, when the land is greened up um, and a lot of the birds are, are breeding. Um, we do a birding trip in November and we do one in April. By November, the rains have normally just about started. Um, and, when, um, and when the land does green up, it brings in some um, inter-African migrants from, from further north, as well as Palearctic migrants down coming down from Europe. But as soon as the rains have fallen and things green up a bit, you get a wonderful variety of, of cuckoos, um, the most, probably the most spectacular of which is a stunning um, African um, emerald cuckoo. Other commoner birds around include the grey go away bird, um, so named because of its call. It has a kawaii, kawaii type call, which sounds a bit like go away, go away. So it's a common bird throughout much of um, of sub-Saharan um, Africa. Um, and something a little bit uh, rarer, um, the, uh, the, the wattled crane, which you can find in the, in the wetter areas of, of the country, especially up in the Okavango. So we include, say, the, the Kwai concession, because there it's, it's, you're not so restricted on the activities that you can do. So you can do a walking safari um, in the morning, um, first light and that gives you a great opportunity really to to look at the, the smaller uh, um, wildlife and in particular for the birders it's, it's great to be out on out on foot and it's easier to to bird watch in that way but in choir you can also uh, take a night drive which you can't do in in Maremi. you have to be back in uh, back in on the camp by dark when in choir you can head out with a spotlight after dark and go look for some of the nocturnal animals and hopefully see um, including the bizarre spring hare, which is a, about the size of a rabbit, and it's a cross, it looks like a cross between a kangaroo um, and uh, and a rabbit. And it's time also to look for for hunting um, uh, leopards. And there are some nocturnal birds to look to check out. Um, if you're lucky, the spectacular pennant winged uh, nightjar, along with giant eagle owl, white faced scops owl. Um, and a variety of other interesting species as well. Now, whilst our trips, our main tours don't include time in the heart of the Delta, um, um, we do offer the opportunity to extend these tours. We find a lot of people decide just to extend their tour by three or four days, hop on a, on a light aircraft in Morn, and then fly to the, to the heart of the Okavango to stay in one of the, the camps right out in the permanent waters of the, um, of the Delta. Um, and this is where you get to see that fantastic um, view of the Okavango Delta um, with a maze of waterways and woodland stretching up into the distance. You'll be flying over herds of elephants, pods of hippos in the water and heading out to a lovely camp such as, such as Guns Camp here, um, one of the so-called wet camps in the, say, the, in the permanent water and here you do it more than um, rather than do lots of game drives you're doing mostly game walks and um, and Mokoro rides as well. These are very comfortable camps and they're, very, they're mostly very small they take sort of 15 to, to, to 20 people and so you head out um, each day um, either out on, on a Mokoro ride out into the into the wetlands or um, out on a walk. In the dry months of the year, a lot of these camps also do offer um, um, vehicle safaris as well. So if you particularly wanted one that did vehicle safaris as well as the Makoros and the walks, then that's certainly um, um, possible. But being out on Makoro is a wonderfully peaceful way of exploring the Delta. And you get to see some of the smaller, um, um, more unobtrusive 
um, types of wildlife as well as the, the bigger um, um, mammals and birds. So the wonderful little painted reed frog here is commonly seen um, out in the waterways. You've got the lovely uh, African chicana, the reed trotter. You've got all kingfishers, great and small, from the, from the small little malachite kingfisher up to the um, giant kingfisher, which is one, um, one of the, the largest kingfishers in the world. And the same with the herons, you've got a small uh, black heron here doing its umbrella fishing where it, uh, it stretches its wings over its head to create a little patch of shade, which attracts fish and it can more, eat, more easily catch the fish that way, up to the Goliath heron, um, the, the largest heron again in the world. And if you particularly want to see Pell's fishing owl, well, the, the Okavango is the place to, um, to, to, to see it. Um, and there are a couple of camps, Pom Pom Camp, that I went to a few years ago, had a Pell's fishing owl. She come down and sit outside of the, the main restaurant area on a tree in a lake in, in the evening. Um, so if you particularly want to see Pell's, let us know and we'll see which is the check to see which is the best lodge um, at the moment to see this spectacular, huge owl. And as his name suggests, it feeds primarily on fish um, and will also take frogs as well. Um, I'm just going to now just finally take you down to further south in, in Botswana. Um, the um, Maremi and the Okavango is probably the key safari destination in the country and the place that most people think of when they think of Botswana. But um, the Botswana has other fantastic um, wildlife reserves to enjoy. The central Kalahari Desert being, being one of them. This is to the south of Morn. It's about a six hour drive down from, from Morn. And the Central Kalahari Game Reserve covers nearly 53,000 square kilometres of land. And that's 10% of Botswana's land area, which is actually larger in size than, than the country, than, than the Netherlands. It's quite different to the Okavango. Of course, it's much drier. It's a flat, dry, scrubby landscape dotted with dry pan, dry, dried out lakes grasslands, woodlands and, and dunes. But even though it does come across as being quite a harsh de and um, dry desert type landscape, it is still full of, uh, of wonderful uh, wildlife. So our Botswana Kalahari Desert uh, tour goes in March time. We do this, we, we operate it in March. At the end of the rains, this time of year, um, the, the Kalahari does green up a bit more. Um, then later on in the year when it gets a lot drier. So it's a 10 day tour, first night staying in Morn, and then the other six nights split between um, campsites in Deception Valley and Passage, Passage Valley. It's quite a typical sort of scene down in the central Kalahari, a flat grassy plains dotted with Gems, Hemsbok, um, the Oryx. Once again, it's a very similar setup to the campsites. You, you've got your own tents, we have our own private um, camp campgrounds, um, and a very comfortable way of exploring the land. In in March time, say after the after the rains of uh, December, January, February, um, if the rains have been good, then you get this wonderful display of flowers um, um, popping up out of the dry desert landscape. It really, is quite a, a fleeting show of colour before they're. Um, um, desiccated by the by the hot sun. The wildlife here is uh, really interesting, but it is in many ways quite different to the to the Okavango. So we can extend an Okavango trip down into the central Kalahari if you want to get a contrasting variety of wildlife and landscapes. That was um, springbok that I just showed you earlier. Um, a uh, um, an antelope um, that specialises in these very dry um, habitats. The central Kalahari is home to the famous black, black maned lions. Um, it has one of the highest densities of, of cheetah um, anywhere in Botswana. Cheetah like in these open, um, flat, wide open um, landscapes, and they, they prey primarily on the um, on the springbok. If you're lucky, there are there are wild dog here as well, and they do range over over huge areas. Um, but this. But uh, we had the group, well, the last group we operated to Kent of Kalahari, which was back in um, March 2020, just before lockdown, and had some really nice views of wild dog. 
There are um, surricate, me meerkats to, to be seen, and some interesting birds as well from the huge Cory Bustard, um, one of the world's heaviest, um, largest flying birds, to the beautiful crimson breasted shrike um, and the lovely little violet eared waxbill. Um, and there's some being a very a harsh desert environment, there's some quite interesting, more unusual species to look out for here as well. Um, the bat eared fox, um, a specialist of these very dry habitats that feeds a lot of insects and termites. Um, they, are, they are quite commonly seen, but you need to be uh, very lucky indeed to see the, uh, the, the aardvark. Um, and to, um, so, but if you do, if you are particularly keen on seeing aardvark, actually the tour to, to consider is a trip we do down to South Africa called South Africa's Rare Mammals. Um, on that particular tour, we've not actually failed to see aardvark um, on, on any trip that we've run over um, since we started the, the tour a few years ago. And of course, at sunset, the, the wonderful clear air, unpolluted by any sort of light pollution, reveals this amazing um, starscape of the, of the Milky Way. It's the, the, always one of the most endearing memories of any trip down into the deserts of, of Africa and these amazing views of the, of the heavens. Um, and just put a couple of final slides in to illustrate that we can also extend your tour to Botswana with time of the Victoria Falls as well. So after the central Kalahari, you can hop up to Vic Falls and it's this time of year when the falls are um, at, their, at their highest um, at the flood. If you want to go later on at the end of our, um, um, our uh, Okavango trips, which is on September, October, November, then the water levels are, are that much lower. And as Georgie mentioned, the place to stay is, is Water Berry Lodge on the edge of the, the Zambezi River. Um, as well as the falls, it's, there's some interesting different birds to be seen around the lodge and around the Victoria Falls area, including the trumpeter hornbills here. And it's the place to go to see um, Zambia's only uh, population of, of white rhino in the Mosiun Tunya uh, National Park. So I will leave it there with, uh, with a sunset over the, um, over the plains of, of Africa. And say thank you very much for listening. Um, and any questions, please let us know. We'll have a question and answer session at the end of the, of the evening. Um, and I think we're going to stop for a break now, but I shall pass over to Kerry to come. Thanks, Paul. Um, yes, thank you. We're going to stop for um, just under 10 minutes now. So we'll be back at um, 25 past. Apologies for the slightly shaky start in our part this evening. I think Georgie's computer threw a wobbly and my baby woke up screaming with 30 seconds to go. So it wasn't the smoothest start, but we're back on track. And I've even got Neil with us now as well, which is a great relief to everyone. So um, go and fill your glasses, get a cup of tea, a bite to eat, whatever you want. And we'll see you at 25 past. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. So hi. So my name is Ben Chappell. Um, I... Until about a year and a half ago, I worked full time for Nature Trek. Um, but since then, I've been doing, I've been very lucky to do quite a lot of day trips for the company, which I've really enjoyed. Um, but for my day job, I'm now predominantly based at the Zoological Society of London um, at the Institute, Institute of Zoology, where I work in the African wild dog team. And I will be talking a little bit about some of the work that I've been doing there. Um, but yeah, over the course of the talk. Um, but really this evening, what I'm going to be speaking about is all things African wild dog. This is an absolutely fantastic animal, really, really wonderful, charismatic species. Uh, and I know a lot of you will be familiar with them. Many of you will probably have seen them um, in the wild yourselves. Uh, and, and certainly for, for passionate wildlife lovers traveling to Africa, this is one of the absolute um, top target species. So over the next few minutes, I'm going to talk a lot about their, their ecology and their conservation, um, some of the threats they face, um, and then a little bit about uh, where you can go if you really want to see them in the wild. Although you know, I think that, that has been covered really nicely um, by some of the previous, previous talks. Now, I thought I'd just start very quickly by, by showing this, this uh, evolutionary tree, um, which gives you a, an idea of, of where wild dogs fit in amongst the wider dog family. So you can see I, I've, I've circled wild dog at the bottom of your screen. You can see they are on this branch um, that includes uh, at the top there, the gray wolf and, and uh, domestic dog. Also some other things like coyote, Ethiopian wolf. Um, and although they are 
the, the most distant branch of this, this little grouping, they are still more closely related to uh, what we might think of as the true dogs um, than um, things like side-striped jackal and black-backed jackal, the, the two African jackal species are. So the, although they are quite evolutionarily distinct and distinctive from, from other dog species, they remain very much a part of, of the dog family, um, not quite so, so distant as we, as we might have imagined in the past. Now, it is also a highly endangered species. It's the second most endangered uh, large carnivore in Africa um, after the Ethiopian wolf. Now, in the early 20th century, um, it was estimated that the population of African wild dogs might have run into the hundreds of thousands. Um, sadly, today, that the, it's just a tiny, tiny percentage of that. Um, the most recent estimate is about 6,000 adult wild dogs, only 1,400 of which are actually mature adults. Um, and yeah, so before, um, before they were systematically eradicated from most of Africa, uh, they really would have existed in pretty much all habitats other than the densest tropical forests um, and the driest deserts. They're incredibly adaptable. Wherever there's enough prey for them, they're, they're generally capable of surviving. Um, but now they're only found in around 13 or so of their original 40 range states. Um, and no, you can see this, this very fragmented distribution across Africa. Uh, it's likely that no single subpopulation that's left on the continent has more than 250 mature individuals. So even in their greatest strongholds, um, they're still very precariously placed, um, which, is, which is worrying. Now, they face a pretty wide variety of threats, um, the biggest of which historically has certainly been habitat loss. Now, habitat loss has affected wildlife across the world and across Africa. Um, but wild dogs are almost un unusually vulnerable to it because they are one of the most wide ranging of all, of all mammals. You know, a pack of African wild dogs could have a a home range um, that stretches into the hundreds of square kilometers, perhaps even in certain situations into the thousands of square kilometers. And so uh, unless you have a truly vast area of relatively undisturbed habitat, even the biggest national parks in Africa, and Africa, of course, has some of the most spectacular, broadest sort of landscapes for wildlife in the world, actually, it's pretty unlikely that you're going to have enough space to conserve a viable population of, of African wild dogs. Uh, and that's a big reason why they've disappeared from, from so much of their former range. Persecution has also been um, a big problem and actually continues to, to be one. Um, in fact, in, in, in a lot of national parks, even up until quite late in the 20th century, that the policy was to, to shoot wild dogs because they were considered vermin. So in the Kruger National Park in South Africa, um, in the first few decades after the park was, was proclaimed, um, thousands of wild dogs were killed. Um, deliberately by park management because they um, perceived them to be a threat to, to game. And thankfully, that kind of attitude has completely changed now. Um, but they are still vulnerable to persecution when they come up against um, farmers and when they, they do occasionally take livestock. And they're also quite vulnerable to snares. Um, but because they're so wide ranging, they often move out of strictly protected areas into places with high human population. Um, and areas where there's lots of hunting. And although those snares are probably set for other animals, uh, wild dogs are often caught up in them. Um, disease is also a big problem for wild dogs. They're very vulnerable to a lot of diseases that are carried by other predators, um, including domestic dogs. And so the area that um, my team at ZSL um, works on mostly um, is the Lycipia area of, of northern central Kenya, and up until a few years ago, this was one of the biggest single populations left in Africa. But over the course of just a few months, um, three or four years ago, all but three adults in this population were killed, uh, died of canine distemper virus. Um, it was an extraordinary die off. Um, and it coincided with uh, a drought which was pushing pastoralists into wildlife areas, bringing their domestic dogs and bringing those dogs into close proximity with the wild dogs. Um, and uh, yeah, it really was a devastating event. Um, and the problem is that because there are so few areas where wild dogs are completely insulated from contact with people, um, th this, this threat of disease and disease transmission, particularly from domestic dogs, is really not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, another big threat, which I will um, talk about a little bit later, um, is climate change. Climate change does seem to, to be um, a bit of a problem for wild dogs. And that's something that, that I've been working on. And um, we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case um, in a few minutes. 
Now, while dogs are a pack animal, um, across their range, the, the average pack size tends to be around 10 individuals. It does vary. Um, there are packs nowadays that can reach 30 or 40, maybe even more than that in exceptional situations. But there are historical records of uh, maybe questionable validity, but, but that um, indicate that there may have been aggregations of wild dogs in the past that went even into triple figures. Um, those are unlikely to have been stable packs if they were true, but that gives you a bit of an indication of, of just how severely wild dogs have been affected by loss of habitat and, and other threats over the, the last century in particular. Now, wild dogs have quite an unusual, quite an interesting uh, reproductive um, system, quite an interesting re reproductive biology. So within that pack of however many individuals, there will be just a single alpha pair, an alpha male and female, that monopolize almost all the time, monopolize the breeding. Um, so they will be the only individuals within the pack that reproduce. And other uh, adults within the pack, generally speaking, are only involved in helping that alpha pair to raise their offspring. Now, although the male, um, alpha male, tends to have gotten that position through fighting, through conflict with other males, generally speaking, more often than not, the, the female gets into that position simply by being the most senior, the oldest female in the pack. Um, but yeah, so it's an interesting situation. Uh, this is a, this is an alpha female here. Um, you can see she is, um, she's just, this one has actually just given birth to pups. She's really, really swollen. You can see those great big teats um, for the milk. Now, in southern Africa, while dogs tend to den, um, or they do den in the southern winter, in the dry season, um, that can be a really great, reliable time to see them if you know the location of a den. I know Georgie was talking a little bit earlier about packs in some areas that are monitored with radio collars. And, and if that's the case, and if you're, in, if you're somewhere that has access to that sort of tracking technology, then seeing wild dogs can, can sometimes be no easier than when they're denic because they are confined to a relatively small area around the den. Um, now, the, the pups for the first few months of their lives um, are confined to the den. Um, and during that time, when the dogs go out hunting, they will leave uh, an adult, at least one adult there to babysit. But by the time they're a couple of months old, they will actually join the pack on the move, um, even though they remain extremely small. Now, because um, wild dog reproduction is basically monopolized by this alpha pair, um, and by definition, the pups will be their offspring. Um, if, if a young wild dog wants to reproduce itself, it will have to disperse, it will have to leave its natal pack. And they do that in single sex dispersal groups. Um, and when they're, when they're off, they'll be looking for um, either another single sex dispersal group of, of the opposite sex to join up with and make a new pack. Um, or actually, sometimes they will just join an existing pack and hope to work their way up within the hierarchy of that pack, which will be made up of unrelated individuals. Um, and actually, this dispersal period is, is an incredibly important part of their lives. It's probably the most important time. You know, they are facing huge amount of danger. They're traveling into they're traveling large distances into areas that they're very unfamiliar with. And often the kind of threats that they'll be facing there will be highly, highly magnified. And it's a, it's a time in a wild dog's life that we know very little about at the moment. Um, and there's a lot more research to do to help us to work out how best to conserve them. Now, wild dogs are um, crepuscular in terms of their activity. So generally speaking, they are most active in the first few hours of the day around dawn, and then again, um, just immediately prior to dusk. Um, and after they've gone out for a morning hunt, they'll tend to spend the hottest part of the day uh, lying about somewhere cool, um, often in these amazing kind of very um, endearing bundles of bundles of dog. They, they love each other's company. They're, they're very keen on physical touch and all that kind of stuff. Um, I sort of think this, when you look at it and see them like this, it almost looks almost perfectly like um, like sort of dappled leaves, sun, sunlight um, dappling leaves under the shade of a nice tree. Um, so they're often very camouflaged too. But then as the afternoon wears, wears on and things cool down, um, they start to pick up their activity again. And often one of the first things that happens is they do these incredible uh, greeting rituals, these, these amazing kind of whirring displays where they all tear around each other, making these incredible um, whistling and squeaking noises. Really clear that they're absolutely exhilarated in each other's company. It's a really fantastic, incredible thing to watch. Um, it does have a purpose, so it's partly to reinforce the bonds that they have between individuals, which might be important in the hunt that's coming up. And it's also, um, it's also kind of interesting that they are 
Um, this was shown a few years ago that one of the things they're doing is they're actually deciding whether to go hunting at all. Um, and the way they do this is actually by sneezing. So some of you may have heard um, heard this, this story a few years ago when it was revealed by a team in Botswana. Actually, the dogs, while they're doing these displays, they are exhaling very audibly. Um, and if a majority of dogs within the pack sneeze, then the pack will set off hunting. Um, if they don't, then they'll go and settle down again, go back to sleep and maybe try again in a few minutes. Um, but the alpha pair um, have more votes than the rest of the pack. So if the alpha pair decide that it's time to go hunting, it doesn't matter whether the other dogs want to go or not. The, the hunt will go ahead and happen. Now, when they're hunting, um, they're hunting uh, quite a wide variety of different, um, different antelope. Um, although most across most of their range, so most of the places where wild dogs are found, uh, impala, which is this species here, is the most important prey item. So wild dogs are, um, they weigh about 20 to 30 kilos on average themselves, um, and their favourite prey size is about 50 kilos, um, and that sort of fits impala pretty much perfectly. Uh, greater kudu is also uh, a popular prey item, um, and in some areas they, um, they will target a lot of smaller stuff. Uh, particularly in areas maybe outside of formerly protected areas where the, the density of really uh, large ungulates might be a bit lower. And very, very occasionally, they might take something larger. So there are records of them killing things as big as buffalo, um, but that would be pretty rare. And that's, um, that would be a pretty serious effort of um, cooperation between a pack to bring down something um, that was probably could weigh more than, more than 10 times as much as a wild dog. Now, wild dogs are known as cursorial hunters. Um, so that basically means that they tend to chase their prey down, sometimes over very long distances, uh, and effectively wear them out and, until they collapse with exhaustion and they can be killed. Um, and that's in contrast to, say, the ambush tactics of, of predators like lions and leopards. Now, this is a, um, this is a picture I took in Medique Game Reserve in South Africa a few years ago, with these dogs chasing a very unfortunate female kudu uh, into, this, into this little lake. Um, she did actually get away um, and, and stood, stood for hours in the shallows while the pack kind of locked, um, yeah, gazed longingly at what should have been their dinner. Um, eventually, they had to give up when it got dark um, and the kudu, yeah, made, it, made, it, made an escape for how long, I'm not sure. Now, you may well have seen um, some of the uh, sort of documentary footage of wild dogs hunting. And one of the classic sort of examples of wild dog hunting that's often shown on TV are these incredibly elongated, prolonged chases across very open countryside um, where they're, they're chasing something like this, this blue wildebeest here. Um, and although, yes, dogs are capable of doing this, this is a way they hunt. Uh, generally speaking, this is very atypical. Um, while dogs are really not a, a species of open, of open habitats, they, are, they much prefer uh, denser, bushed, bushy areas where these kind of really prolonged chases are a bit more difficult because there are many more opportunities for the prey item to, to slip out of sight. And in fact, you know, what's much more typical in these environments where kind of coordination between in individuals is, is much harder to achieve, it's a bit of a free-for-all, actually. Um, the dogs are essentially chasing things spontaneously whenever they see them, um, hoovering up little antelope like Dictic. So in Kenya, where I, where I um, mostly work, um, the, uh, the most important prey item for wild dogs there are, are these Gunter's Dictics, um, very small animals. They barely stop even to, to, to eat them. They just sort of hoover them up and, and carry on going. Uh, they also love to hunt from roads, um, which can be a fantastic thing if you're visiting one of these parks. Uh, they love the, the roads provide kind of quiet, efficient travel through the bush, um, enable them to, 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 find, to find antelope um, without having to, to push through dense vegetation. Now, um, they have acquired a sort of reputation in the past as being a bit of a slightly brutal killer. Um, and that is because they sometimes uh, do start eating their prey uh, before it's actually dead. Um, there are important reasons for this, which I'll go into shortly. Um, so, and actually, in fact, when they do make a kill, there's quite, a, um, there's quite an established protocol for what happens and the established relationships between the dogs at the kill. So it's likely that in this kind of free-for-all, this melee where dogs are going off after different antelope all at different times, that the dogs that do make a kill might do it without the knowledge of a lot of the rest of the pack. So what they'll do more often than not is they'll try and eat as quickly as they can um, the bits of the carcass that are most nutritious. So that, that could be the liver, that could be some of the other, the other internal organs. They then call the other dogs in, uh, the other dogs arrive, 
And as soon as that happens, it's the pups, um, particularly the pups younger than a year old, that are actually allowed to eat first. So the dogs on the kill will make way for those youngest individuals. It's so only after the pups have finished eating that the alpha pair come in. Um, and then finally, after the alpha pair have had their fill, um, the adult dogs that weren't involved in making the kill um, uh, get, get to have a share themselves. And that's really interesting because, you know, for one thing, it means that the, the youngest individuals in the pack who might otherwise be the most vulnerable are actually always well, well fed and, and have the best opportunity possible to develop. It also means that adult dogs who aren't the alphas are highly, highly incentivized to be involved in, in hunting uh, because otherwise they run the risk uh, of not getting any food at all. Um, it's also really important for the pack to come together um, around the kill because they have to be incredibly vigilant. Um, in particular, they have to look out for spotted hyena, um, which is a kleptoparasite with the wild dogs. It means they often steal wild dog kills and that can be really problematic for wild dogs. They also have to watch out for lions. Lions will take their food as well, um, but, but even more importantly, lions often kill wild dogs. So under relatively undisturbed conditions, it's, it's lions that are by far the biggest cause of, of wild dog mortality. Um, and actually, so this, this pack here that I'd seen, seen make a kill in the Kruger National Park in South Africa, um, they were resting after making the kill. Um, and then suddenly this lioness, out of nowhere, didn't even see her, came shooting in, grabbed one of the wild dogs and killed it um, and sent, sent the rest of the pack absolutely scattering. So not being vigilant around kills can be, can be a huge problem for wild dogs. And they really do need to watch out for, um, for, for lions and hyenas. Now, I mentioned the impact of climate change on wild dogs briefly earlier. Um, now, it's actually their hunting behavior that seems to be the reason why they are vulnerable to the effects of climate change. Now, um, when temperatures are persistently hot, wild dogs tend to have higher mortality, so more of them die. More of the pups die as well, which means their reproductive success goes down. Um, and there are some clues as to why that might be. So on days with higher temperatures, wild dogs tend to hunt for a shorter period of time in the morning and in the evening. Um, they also, when it's hotter, give up chases much more quickly. Um, so it seems like there's actually this risk when it's hotter of them overheating. Um, and there's, there seems to be this direct physiological impact of higher temperatures on wild dogs. And basically what that means is if temperatures keep going up, wild dogs are actually going to have fewer and fewer opportunities to hunt and their food intake might go down. Um, and that could be, could be part of the explanation for why they, do, why they do badly at high temperatures. The other reason could be that they are when temperatures are really high, um, it's been shown that wild dogs uh, hunt more at night to compensate for the fact that they couldn't hunt during the day. Um, and given that wild dogs spend most of their time doing their absolute best to avoid coming into contact with lions and hyenas, hunting at night when those animals are much, much more active is clearly an act of desperation, basically. Um, and so if they're forced to hunt more at night to compensate for not being able to hunt so well in the daytime, um, that, that means they're coming into contact with lions and hyenas more often, losing more of their food and, and presumably getting killed more often by the, um, by, the, um, by the lions as well. Now, I will just, in the last few minutes, I will just go very briefly through some of the places that I think are um, great places to look for wild dogs. Now, the Salu Game Reserve, uh, which I believe has now been renamed as Nyerere National Park in, in Tanzania, um, has the largest single population of wild dogs in one protected area. And the, the Salu is something like 50,000 square kilometers. It's an absolutely vast, vast area. Um, and that can be a good place to go. Uh, Northern Botswana, as, as Paul mentioned earlier, is a fantastic place to see wild dogs. Uh, in fact, the whole area between um, uh, Eastern Namibia all the way through Northern Botswana into Western Zimbabwe um, is a wonderful, wonderful place to see wild dogs um, amongst a whole variety of other, of other wildlife that lives, um, particularly around the Okavango Delta, which is one of the most spectacular places for nature in the world, um, a place where you can explore on, on Makoro like this. Uh, South Luangwa, which, which Georgie mentioned earlier, um, is an increasingly great place to see wild dogs. The population there seems to have gone up quite considerably in the last few years. Um, and as she mentioned, in the green season, actually, it, it can be quite, um, yeah, they can be very reliable. Um, I'm just going to mention for the last couple of minutes that the Kruger National Park in South Africa, which um, has quite a sizable population of wild dogs. The, the latest estimate is between 300 and 350 individuals. 
Um, it's a spectacular park, um, a place that you can drive in yourself. Nature Trek also runs some fantastic tours here. Um, and because you have the opportunity there on this, this very expansive network of roads to travel really wide, travel really widely, travel quite long distances, uh, you actually have quite a good chance of, of pinning down wild dogs, um, even if they are moving about quite considerably. Um, yeah, beautiful, beautiful animals. This was a, a pack I spent most of the day with um, a few years ago when I was traveling in Kruger. Uh, it's a great place to see rhinos as well, um, although in, less and less so sadly now um, with the poaching crisis. Uh, hyenas too, which are uh, yeah, lovely to see for people, not, not so good for wild dogs. A great place to see leopard. Um, cheetah are there as well. Um, it's a fantastic place for, for all sorts of wildlife, including wild dogs, uh, impala. And I uh, haven't mentioned birds so much today, but, but all the places where you go where you'd see wild dogs are, are fantastic for birding. And, and some, of the, some of the bird life around camps and around the bush is just incredibly charismatic and incredibly interesting. This is an African scops owl. So I'll just finish by, by saying something very briefly. Um, I have talked a little bit about the impacts of climate change on African wild dogs. Um, and I think it, it can sometimes be tempting to think that, therefore, uh, visiting them, flying to Africa to see wild dogs, might not be in their interests, and that therefore sitting, staying at home and not going to see them would be the best thing you could do to support their conservation. Um, and of course, we do absolutely have to be careful about our impacts on the environment and examine those and make as many improvements as we possibly can. But in fact, the indications are that without tourism, wild dogs would really suffer. So most of the, the areas that they, that they still survive in, most of their greatest strongholds, are heavily reliant on tourism to support their conservation, to fund the work that goes on there. Um, and without tourism, a lot of those places uh, would deteriorate. And we're, we're seeing some of that with, uh, with, um, with COVID. So all I would say um, is that don't think that, <laughs> that avoiding going and seeing wild dogs is in their best interest. It probably isn't. Um, as long as you're sensible, if you're careful to pick a trip that um, is sensitive to their needs and is plugged in with local community conservation programs and that, that provides incentives to, to local people to look after their wildlife, then actually I really do believe that, that traveling to see wildlife and particularly to see wild dogs remains in their best interest and remains a fantastic thing to do to help their conservation. Um, thank you very much. Um, I hope you've enjoyed listening. Um, and yeah, I think we've got a Q&A coming up now. Thank you very, very much, Ben, um, and to Neil before you. So let's get all our speakers back um, and we'll go to a few questions. Um, so doo -doo -doo, where shall we start? Um, let's start with Sue Miller, who was wondering about um, major predators on walking sessions, e.g. crocodiles or current hungry lions, etc. A very important consideration when you start walking around um the bush who wants to take that one i think any of you could take that one um i think probably came during georgie's talk or paul i don't mind i can i can chat about it um yeah of course being being on foot um gives a certain um excitement you know quoi about uh, about a safari um and really you know you you want to see <laughs> you want to see the predators even um when you're on your walk and safari the, the, the actual that the, the the risks are incredibly no, no, your average predator knows you're coming well before you actually see it and will just slink off and actually you'll be very lucky to see anything like a lion or a leopard or a cheetah um but the guides out there like like neil they know how to handle the wildlife anyway they they, they can read these animals and, and um you know this walk and safaris are, are are very safe and um yeah we've never had anybody on a trip as yet so uh, yeah planning on keeping that, <laughs> that unbroken record. Have you ever bumped into a, a big predator, Neil, when you're out on foot? Yeah, we, we have. I have, yeah. Hippo. Hippo has been the, the worst one, yeah. Okay, we won't ask about that story then. <laughs> <laughs> you have to run fast on the hippo. No, yeah. <laughs> I mean, these things happen. It doesn't really happen very often, but they can happen. Uh, you have to be prepared for them. And the problem these days is cell phones, you know, you're walking in the bush or just coming back from lunch, back to your, to your accommodation, and you might be looking at your phone for some other reason. I was actually looking for a bird call and uh, didn't see the hippo until it was almost too late. But yeah, there's always a bush or a tree you can hide behind. Thank you. Okay, great. Um, so a couple of questions about... Um, 
I, well, Paul said he wants to answer it live, and Georgie, I'm sure, can too. Um, and Jennifer's asking about how she goes about visiting the national parks that Georgie mentioned, because I think on our website we do have lots of obvious tours about South Mango National Park and slightly less so about the others. So how how do we get people there? I'll let Georgie answer this one. Um, so either you could uh, join one of our, our standard group tours, which, as you say, predominantly go to South Luangwa, and then we could organise an extension to one of those other national parks instead uh, as well, sorry. Um, or we could organise a completely tailor-made holiday for you. Um, so as, as I said in my intro there, um, if there is anywhere that we don't visit on a group holiday, um, like a few of those parks I've mentioned earlier, then um, that's basically what tailor-made is here for, um, to, to design bespoke itineraries um, completely as you'd like them. But um, equally, you can just do an extension anywhere and everywhere you'd like to go. <laughs> a lot of these tours, people do routinely extend. So you know, spend your 10 days in Sato Anger and then an add on Victoria Falls or go down to the Zambezi, things like that. Um, very easy to do. Um, we've also had questions about, uh, da, 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 I'm going to go back up, mozzies in the Delta. Um, someone else answered that for us. Thank you, Rich. So they were there and there was no problems. But Paul? Um... Well, I, I've never found them to be a problem myself. When, when I've been out of the Dells. But, but, but Neil, I would pass over to Neil probably on this one because he goes there yep. a, lot, a lot more than I do. <laughs> and then Neil, over to you. Mozzies? Yeah, mozzies, generally not a problem. Um, I think uh, they've sprayed mozzies and, uh, in, and they have different ways of capturing them and getting rid of them in the Okavanga Delta. Uh, Paul, I've not been around for two and, two and a half years either, so <laughs> um, I'm not sure what the latest is, but I think most of the time, I mean, in the wet season, if you go in the green season, the, you've got flowing water, so you don't have a problem. You shouldn't have too much of a problem with mosquitoes, whatever time of the year you go. Yeah, I've, I've been in the dry season um, and even then found very little, very few problems. You know, in the evening, you wear a long sleeve, you put on a little bit of insect repellent. You have to yeah. make sure you have um, your malarial prophylactics with you. Um, but it's not certainly not one of those places where you suddenly, you know, in, as soon as the sun sets, you're absolutely covered in biting things. I quite happily sit out by the, by the water with a drink in the evening and really not, not be bothered at all. Um, here's a, a common question that's popped in. What's the best time to go to Botswana for wildlife? Um, well, I, I guess it's, well, it depends what you're after. Um, if for, for mammals, then the, the dry season um, from August through September, October um, is, a, is a great, great time to go. If you're particularly keen on bird life, then the, the greener months are great when you've got the, um, the migrants from Europe and and moving down into Southern Africa and also the inter, inter African migrants coming down into Southern Africa as well. Um, but really any, any time you go to Botswana is, uh, is a good time for the wildlife. There's so much wildlife there. It really doesn't matter. doesn't matter when you go. And there's, I really like this question. Um, oh, I've just clicked off it. Um, um, oh, got back at the top. I think it was Peter, Peter Smith, um, said, so which part of Africa would each of you go to on safari if you could choose just one? Um, I, will, I will kick off an answer um, because I've never been to Botswana. And when I first joined Nature Trek 10 years ago, I worked with Paul. I was Paul's assistant to begin with. And he looked after Botswana and I was involved in those tours. And I think even on my very first day, I had an inquiry about, I think someone wanted to know if we could provide a vegan diet in a Botswana bush camp. Um, and our um, local agents were um, very accommodating, if a little bit stressed by the question. Um, and I mean, that was 10 years ago, things have changed properly, but who knows. Anyway, ever since that moment, I've always, always wanted to go to Botswana. I've not made it yet. It'll be a little while longer with the, the young children here at home at the moment, but I'm definitely gonna get there. And that would, that's my number one destination. For all the reasons that our speakers have given you this evening and through their talks. Um, let's go to Ben, where would you go? I think I'd have to vote for Northern Botswana as well, actually. I'll say something very briefly about it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I just think that, that, yeah, it's fantastic for wild dogs, for one thing. Um, the Okamango Delta, I mean, just 
fly some 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 of the camps you can stay at you know just in the middle of absolutely nowhere and especially if you go to some of the little private ones you, know, you fly in a tiny little bush bush plane sometimes you see people kind of desperately trying to shoo wildlife off this little airstrip as you land it's absolutely magical um I'd, I'd also put in a quick word for the Kruger in South Africa. It, it's, it's got a fantastic amount of wildlife. Um, it's very accessible um, and yeah, a, a superb place, but you, you can't go wrong with a, with a safari in Africa, really. Paul? Um, well, I don't want to be boring and say Botswana. You can't choose, okay, Botswana's <laughs> gone. You can't choose Botswana now. So even if it was <laughs> your favourite, it's gone. <laughs> well, there's a lot of places I've enjoyed, but I, I, I really love, love Tanzania. Um, the, the Serengeti with all the wildebeest and the driving through a herd of 500,000 wildebeest and having cheetahs hop up on top of the vehicle. And yeah, I think Tanzania was absolutely, yes, fabulous, spectacular um, destination. Neil, come to you next. I don't think you're allowed to ask me. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah. Go of course, on. it's Namibia. Of course. <laughs> yeah, Namibia is great because you've got the wildlife, you've got all the parks with really great wildlife, but you also have the diversity of the landscapes, you know, and the scenery that changes and the Atlantic Ocean, the skeleton coast, you have so much just in one package. So, yeah, you can't beat that. No way. Good for Namibia. Thank you. And Georgie? <laughs> I won't be quite as boring as saying Botswana, but I will be quite boring and say Zambia after talking to you about it for 20 minutes. But um, but no, I I hope I was enthusiastic and showed you how much I love it. Um, the beaters are some of my absolute favourite birds. So, I mean, the, the Southern Carmine spectacle is always going to be a winner for me. Um, and just I love that it's so relaxed, um, it's so quiet and there's just so, so much wildlife to see. Um, and yeah, I, I would just go there time and again. I, I can't wait to get back there. I'm, I'm itching to get back there as soon as I can. Good, a good bit for Zambia. We had a question earlier actually, asked someone asking when the green season won, which is generally sort of December. I think it starts raining in November, doesn't it? So sort of December through to May. Um, I've been to Zambia once and I went in March. So that was bang in the middle of the green season. And it was stunning. It was a lovely, lovely time to visit. Um, so if you fancy a green season trip, then I'd vote for that one. Where would you go? Uh, oh, you're going to Botswana. How often Botswana has not been? Yeah, I always <laughs> wanted to. Um, so yeah, put me down, Paul. Hold me a <laughs> hold me a tent, and I'll go. We'll do. Um, now, <clears throat> oh, I know Africa's a big place, but where are we with COVID slash visa etc. Difficulties. I think we're in quite a good place with that, really. I mean, it is a big place. Everywhere's different, and um, those of us in the office basically spend our days on the Foreign Office website, rechecking requirements to get everyone in and out of countries. Um, it does seem to go in the right direction. It seems to be getting easier, not harder. Um, there are countries where you can just go now. Um, the Gambia is one where you, you just arrive and go on a nice holiday. So um, it's all possible. Most places, it's very general, require the arrival test. So um, 48 hour before departure PCR test and it's often a form on arrival. They're all different. So you really need to check each country um, individually, but um, there are hoops to jump through. Um, but we're feeling pretty positive. We're getting tours away to, to lots of destinations now. Um, we're on it with those um, requirements and we'll let you know what you need to do and when. Um, even to point to telling you your 48 hour, win out with 48 hour window before your flight starts now, and this is when you can test from. Um, and we'll give you suppliers. So it, yeah, we'll help you through all of that. Um, ben has inspired many people with his talk this evening. I think there's a lot of love for Ben's Wild Dogs talk. And I think um, there could be a lot of people asking a lot of questions on it for the rest of the evening. So I'm just gonna um, come to you Ben with probably just a couple of follow-up questions. Um, quite a specific one about someone wants to know how big the wild dog dens are and how many young they have um and someone else asked just generally more about um the conservation efforts which you did touch on at the end of your talk um perhaps you could just expand a little bit on that and i i think you could probably yeah. give us a little extra talk on it if you wanted but let's not do that but <laughs> sure yeah yeah so in terms of the, the dens um they, they tend to be in some, something like an old aardvark burrow um so that they won't excavate them themselves um but so yeah big big enough for a for an adult and between two and maybe two and 10 to maybe even 20 at a push um, pups. The, the, the older the female is, generally speaking, the fewer pups you'll produce. So in their kind of last year of reproduction, an alpha female might only produce 
there could it could only be two might even might even might, might only be kind of three or four maybe a um, pretty small number um in terms of the conservation efforts yeah, yeah there is there is a lot of stuff going on to try and protect wild dogs um Georgie again alluded to this a bit earlier with the sort of the monitoring that's going on in terms of satellite tagging, satellite collaring wild dogs. So in, in Kruger, for example, you know, a lot of the, the population increase that's happened over the last few years has been as a result of much better monitoring of the, of the dogs in the park. So if they wander out of the park somehow onto farmer's land or close to local communities, actually they'll, they'll get an alert and they'll actually be able to work out, you know, let people know that they're there figure out ways of minimizing human wildlife conflict. Um, so that's been a big step forward. Um, in South Africa as well, there's a meta population project. So although a lot of the, the game reserves in South Africa aren't big enough to support viable populations of wild dog on their own, um, if they're managed as kind of one system where you, know, you, do, you do the dispersal that would happen under natural conditions in a large reserve you know, artificially by moving dogs between reserves, then actually you can, you can um, raise wild dog numbers quite considerably. So that's been really successful. Um, and then in, in East Africa, in Kenya, where, I, where I'm um, where I'm about to go out and, and do some work for most of this year, um, there have been some very successful community engagement pro pro projects. So making people, educating people about wild dogs, making it clear they really don't take livestock as often as a lot of people think, um, trying to get people to see them as an asset, um, make it clear how many you know, tourists want to come and see them and how they can actually make money by having wild dogs around. Um, as Kerry said, there's a lot more to say, but I hope that covers a, covers a bit of it. Brilliant. Thanks, Ben. Um, I think we're about there with our questions. This is any last minutes people can type in quickly. Um, Georgie, some, someone's very grateful for the tailor-made trip that you've organised to Zambia, Zimbabwe and Botswana in May, and they're very excited. That is the way to choose your favourite safari, isn't it? Just pick all the countries and go to them all. Absolutely. That is a bit of a mammoth one. I'm very excited for you. <laughs> yeah, I bet. Um, right, so I think that's all the questions in. So thank you very much to Paul, to Georgie, to Neil, to Ben, um, some very inspiring safari talks. Um, yeah, I hope um, everyone's going to go to bed dreaming of, of Africa and um, their next holidays. So um, next up, we have on Friday, I believe, a virtual tour. If you haven't joined one of our virtual tours yet, this could be the moment for you to join us in Lake Kikini in Greece. Um, you can sign up for that on our website. And the next stop on our Winter Road Show is botanizing and birding in the European Alps. So we'll be going to Mallorca, to Puglia in Italy, to the Isles of Scilly, um, and I'll be talking about one of my favorite locations, the Swiss Alps. So uh, that is, I think it's next Wednesday. Um, it will say on our website anyway. So if you fancy that, do sign up and we will look forward to seeing you all then. Um, thanks once again to all the speakers and good night to everyone. Right. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Bye.